Hello, I'm Paul Briley, and you're listening to Off the Comma. I'm a human who cares about supporting other humans. On this podcast, we explore all facets of what it means to feel stuck in life. We talk with people just like us who have found themselves sitting on a comma and not knowing where to go next. We will unpack the experience with them, where they've been stuck, what it feels like, what they experienced, and what they learned. My goal is to inspire you by seeing yourself in others. I believe that when we feel more connected and seen, magic can happen. If you find yourself sitting on a comma in your life, remember, you can also talk to me without a microphone. To explore coaching with me and getting off the comma in your own life, book a call with me at offthecomma.com. In the meantime, let's get into this week's conversation. And we're back with another episode of Off the Comma with another exciting guest. And I am actually really looking forward to this conversation this week because I'm here with Christine Colson. And she is another one of my newer colleagues and friends from across the pond over in the United Kingdom. And um, she and I have gotten to know each other just a little bit over this past year. And I'm looking forward to getting to know her a little bit more in our conversation today. So with that, Christine, I'm going to turn it over to you and and uh, let you kind of start doing the talking. Christine, tell us, how would you like to be known? Hi, Paul. Um, I always think it's a bit strange to sort of describe yourself. Um, but when when forced to come up with three words, um, I like to think I'm quite honest. I'm quite blunt in that regard as well. People tend to know where they stand with me. I'm quite understanding, I think, in that both sort of empathetically, but also I'd rather know where I stand, deal with it and move on, if that makes sense. And mm. I, I like to think I'm quite witty. Mm. I um, There's a bit of sense of a sense of humor there. OK, so the humor makes uh, makes for the wittiness. Yes, but I might have just, yeah, if this turns out to be a really droll podcast, I apologize for that. <laughs> just set it up. <laughs> oh, I'm so funny. You're I really going right. to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a saying in the States. I don't know if you use it over there in the UK, but it's like, oh, I hope this doesn't make a liar out of me. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> nice. Christine, um, I, I have no doubt, and this is how I know you as well, so I have no, I, no doubt that this is going to come through in your story today. Um, what else would you like for folks to know about you before we get started? So I'm Christine. I'm, I'm in my, I like to say, early 40s. I live in Derbyshire in the UK, which is part of my story. Um, I work as a radiographer. In the in the NHS, and as you know, Paul, how I met you, I'm also I don't drink, and off the back of that, I'm also a sobriety coach. But um, yeah, so but it's a personal story that I'm I've brought to you today, my personal nice. comma. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to getting into it. Um, before we actually start with the 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 five questions that provide the framework for each episode, I, I want to do something that I do with all of my guests. And that is, as you think ahead to the story, you're going to be sharing the conversation we're going to have over the next 45 minutes or so. What intention would you have for yourself, Christine? Um, I, I, the intention is a bit of closure mm -hmm. and a bit of acknowledgement of the comma and the fact that I'm past it. And um, yeah, it's it's quite a big one in my life. So sort of just a, a part of the process of working through it and putting it behind me, to be honest. Mm, okay. Um, well, I'm hoping that we can give you the space to do that today. And that is actually one of my intentions is to be able to create space and create that conversation so you can share your story. And also in sharing your story, not only do you get the closure that you're looking for and, and that acknowledgement, but that others out there who are listening to your story see a little bit of themselves in you and your experience. And in doing so, it helps them feel a little bit more connected, a little less alone, and in the best cases, a little inspired and empowered to maybe do something different for them themselves and change the narrative of their story. So. Fingers crossed. <laughs> nice. Okay. Well, Christine, you and I haven't really talked about what you're going to be sharing today. So I'm looking forward to hearing this story as well. So let's jump in with the first question. Christine, where have you found yourself sitting on a comma in your life? Well, my comma lasted probably three years. 
um, four years at a max, but um, and it's a, quite a geographical comma. So mm-hmm. I found myself very much stuck in my previous home. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd moved to the town in Yorkshire um, back in 2012 for work. Um, in the NHS. Um, and I've worked in various hospitals in the area. And I bought my house there um, in 2014, full of intentions, you know, and I first, one of the first things I did was decorated. It didn't need that much doing to it. But I re- wanted really, after years of renting, I was really excited about getting settled, um, creating my home that I really wanted to live in. And it went quite well. Um, there was a situation in my employment that was difficult. And um, back in 2016, I had a little bit of mental health um, turmoil and I ended off ended up being off work for seven months. Mm-hmm. And what I've what I found was that sort of so that was 2016. And then sort of the next few years, I, it was, I was surviving. It was fine. Life was going okay. But then sort of at the start of the pandemic and my neighbours changed. And I sort of really found that um, I was surviving in that house more than than, any th- than ever before. And um, yeah, that and that, especially since since the start of the pandemic, those last sort of four years, that was a real three years. That was a real sort of comma for me in sorting myself out to to move on because there was a few elements that, that had to be sorted for that to happen. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that it was quite a long and quite emotional comma. It, it sounds like it, and and what I'm hearing you describe and. As I reflect things back, obviously, if I misstate anything or if there's something that's incorrect, by all means, correct me. Um, that you found it, found yourself in this place that at that point in your life you were excited about and you had intentions, as you said, and, and visions for. And then for whatever reasons, these circumstances ended up not being quite as you envisioned them. And then life brought you these situations and changes and things and that place that you had all these intentions for ended up kind of taking a different turn. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And life changed in that I moved roles. I've changed in my, uh, a lot of my life. I, I, I got out of a relationship that wasn't amazing. A lot of my life changed, but I was still underpinned by being in this home Mm. that, um, that really wasn't, wasn't sort of working for me. And um, I didn't see the comma for a lot of the time that I was sitting on it as well. It's one of those things when it's when you're involved and in your, you're in the middle of this thing, it's hard to sometimes see and realize that you're there. But yeah, it was, yeah, the, it was it, obviously your home is such a massive part of your life and it mm. impacts you in so many ways that, uh, yeah, it was quite, it was, it was really difficult. It was really tough. It sounds like it. And, and, I'm curious, we'll obviously expand on this with some of the other questions, but I'm really curious while you're in this space, all of these things that are happening and and yet the home feels like it's carrying the brunt of, or, or, or kind of holding all of these feelings and emotions for you. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, what, what was it about the home that I, kind I of think- underpinned everything? I think it highlighted for me the fact that I was in a town that I didn't want to be living in. It's not near, you know, I was said it's not near the people I love, both family and friends. Um, I moved to that town specifically for work, knowing no one. So Mm. a lot of the relationships and friendships I'd made were through work. So when I ended up leaving a certain employment, um, I had to cut them off for my own mental health. So I and I found new friends and worked in different places and I've built I've built up the friendships. But also the home was quite a it symbolized a lot with my mental health. If I'm struggling, my tidiness is the first thing to go. I had a counselor back in years ago, like 10 years ago, that once when I turned up for a session, she said, when was the last time you did your washing up? And I was like, oh, now that's quite an insightful question. You know, it is always the first thing that I don't do. And and I I was I was drinking too much, especially in the last few years. Um 
I was it's I was buying stuff thinking that it would make me happy and it didn't. So I had a house full of stuff. I'd sign up for things, you know, I'd have all of these great intentions. Oh, this, this thing I'm buying is about to change my life. It never changed my life because mm. my, because I, my, my, I, I, that wasn't what the problem was. The, you know, the, the painting on the wall wasn't the issue. And, um, so the house in itself sort of symbolized a lot of me being unhappy in in a lot of other places. Mm-hmm. And the, of course you've got the you've got the physical thing of if you're unhappy in your home and you're driving home to it after work. You, you know, you can have a great day at work or a great day out with friends or visiting people and then you get in the car and I found myself um when I first, when I realized the sort of situation I was in, I could feel myself getting heavier as I was driving towards the house. And that was sort of when I realized, and that's why, well, I don't want to jump, I don't want to make you jump around a bit, but you know, that's when I realized I needed to stop drinking and I needed to really sort of work on myself and stuff. It, the, it wasn't the house's fault, but it was very symbolic, even with the neighbors when they moved in. And um, I didn't deal with the issues that we had amongst ourselves particularly well because I wasn't in an amazing place to do so. So even then, the, that the neighbours became symbolic of more unhappiness. So mm. yeah, it's um, it's quite a big it's quite a big symbol in my life that house. I think. Yeah, and that's really coming through, and I can hear kind of as a container all of the things that your house held for you. As you keep referring to the unhappiness, and and if I'm taking you too far ahead in the story, then just tell me. But what was that unhappiness? What what it, is this ultimately representing? Yeah, can I just say if you can hear a cat jingling bell, that's because my cat has just appeared by my I feet. Love it. So, I love yeah. it. <laughs> I'd, lo- I'd love to lock him up, but he will just destroy the room I've locked him into. Oh, oh, oh and so, my experience with cats is you put them behind a door and they're going to double or triple the, yeah, the noise. Ab- yes, absolutely. Sorry, well, I've mi- because he's put me off, I missed your question. No, Sorry. that's okay. The the house as a symbol of your unhappiness. What what was it? What was the unhappiness? It, you've described um, a lot of things, but if you could kind of yeah. summarize it, how would you summarize it? it? Oh, real self unhappiness, a bit of self loathing, mm. um, incredibly lonely um, because I wasn't okay with myself, I think. Um, there was. I was quite unkind to myself in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. I can say looking back on it now. Mm-hmm. So um, I, there's various things that I've used in my life as my identity. You know, I'm single. I don't have kids. Um, I was always quite proud of the fact that I changed career from finance to become a radiographer. You know, I, I, I wanted change. I made change happen. Look at me. I'm, I'm doing what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And when that didn't go to plan, I think I took that as a bit more of a failure. When I took more of that as my own issue when actually it wasn't, but I'm not going to go into, I don't want to drag all that whole situation up, you know, but I, I think I blamed myself for more things and that, um, that, yeah, that was real self, uh, yeah, real self-loathing, actually, over the years. It, it sounds like disappointment, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, um, and again, I'm just, what's coming up for me as I'm, I'm hearing and, and thinking about your story, and, and unfulfilled expectations, there were all these hopes and, and dreams that didn't go as planned. In yeah. House. Yeah. And I think I wasn't back then. I wasn't as, I wasn't as able to cope with things not, not necessarily going to plan. I've been very fortunate in my life um, that things have sort of gone. Okay. <laughs> you know, I got into the university I wanted. I did all right in my career in finance. Everything sort of worked out. Uh, lo- love life aside, but what well, that is disastrous. But, um, <laughs> we can all but, share stories, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's a whole different podcast, mm. but you know, everything sort of, everything 
everything. Yeah, it was very much disappointment. And it's funny because I've just remembered because I got a first in my degree to become a radiographer in the UK. You've got to do a degree. So I'd, I'd done a degree when I was 18 and then I had to go back to university. And a lot of people um, were a bit cynical in a way. Why are you giving up a career to go back to being a student? Mm-hmm. You know, I'd, I'd saved a bit of a house deposit and I was then going to have to use that to live off. And I came out with a first, a first class degree. But to me, I think that was the only option that I gave myself. Because if I'm going to give up a good career to do something differently, I've got to prove that I can. You know, I've got mm-hmm. to prove that I'm good at it. And then making choices that perhaps didn't go to plan. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, disappointment and not knowing how to how to let myself off with that, really. Yeah. Well, and it also seems like, I mean, you yourself just said, like, this this is interesting, right? Because it's it's not just a container, it's also a chapter. And it seems like it's also all of these disappointments and your first time dealing with them. Mm, yes. So yeah. sort of like this house represents an intersection of so many pathways in your life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it looked it as well. You know, when I say, you know, I was buying stuff, it, it, you know, they, they were, there was jokes within my friends that I've become a bit of a hoarder. Ha, 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 ha. And actually, I, that, that wasn't funny as it turned mm. out. Do you know what I mean? That the, 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 the physical re- way that my mental health decline was showing itself mm. by things like not necessarily keeping the house as clean and tidy as I could do. There was things that I would always do. I'd always make sure the cats were okay. You know, I'd always mm-hmm. make sure that they were sort of sorted. And then, then I would just wouldn't necessarily look at, look after myself, but I definitely don't think at the time that anyone who just saw me would have known that definitely my friends and my family, I did not let on that I was going through that, through that difficulty. You were talking about the, the hoarding not being funny. I've done a little professional organizing work as well. Um, it's kind of one of the things that I do. And and that's always, we don't use that term, you know, when you're working with someone, even mm. if somebody themselves says, Oh, you know, my friends call me a hoarder. It, it's packed. It's mm. just packed with so many things. And when yeah. one finds themselves in that situation, there's so many things going on for that person. And so I can, I mm. can definitely appreciate you saying that. Um, as we go into the second question here, you've kind of, you've already touched on some of this a little bit, but as you look at this comment that you were sitting on, what did it create for you or what else did it create for you? Um, It created chaos. (laughs) It created um, just situations that, you know, in the messy house, which, um, I I stopped letting people into. The pandemic was brilliant. Legally, no one allowed in my home. Brilliant. Fantastic. And actually, no one did go into my home after, no friends went into my home after the start of the pandemic till I moved out last month. Um, um, It's, yeah, just absolute, initially, chaos, unhappiness, and, and just real lows but once I'd identified that something had to change it also it's not this isn't a bleak story (laughs) in that I made the changes and actually I can I am so proud of the stuff that I did when I had to Mm. do them so it also long term created some strength but if you do, if 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 I think back now to to well, two thousand at the end of two thousand of twenty twenty, mm-hmm. yeah, just absolute chaos. I wasn't eating well, you know. I wasn't eating healthily. I wasn't. I wasn't. Um, I was drinking too much at that point. The pandemic, work was stressful. Um, I wasn't able to go and see. And, you know, as no one was, I wasn't able to go and see my my family, friends, like work colleagues. I saw quite regularly. They, but. Um, but obviously work was incredibly stressful. So it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a jovial, even when I was seeing people, it was at stressful times. And that, so, it sounds, yeah. it sounds difficult. It sounds heavy and, and self-referencing a little bit. I mean, when it is literally in your home, 
then that, I mean, how much closer can it be? Obviously, I've now moved. I, mean, I said last month that it was February, but that move was so stressful and took so long that it was really triggering to sort of being back at that point when everything was on top of me and I couldn't couldn't work out how to make change. And I was too scared to pick up the phone and, and or do anything to sort of sort it out. And yeah, being trapped in that house for months longer than, 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 than on paper, that should have been a really easy move. And that was sort of quite difficult as well. It sort of did bring back a lot of, a lot of the same emotions actually. And I want to come back to that in just a moment. Um, because you were talking about, you know, it was chaos and, and you certainly shared how difficult this was for you. And yet it sounds like there were some things that also shifted for you during that period because you said you used to drink, you made the decision to move. I'm curious about what, what some of those things are that started to shift while you were in this container as well. Yeah, I just realized that I had to change. It was a conversation with the landlady of the house next door with the neighbors that I didn't get on with. And, and she, she was, the, the neighbors were, um, their kids were a bit unruly. They were an incredibly noisy family. They used to throw things into the garden and all of this sort of stuff. And the landlady wasn't particularly helpful. And, um, and she sort of turned it back onto me. Well, well, you know, you don't care about your garden. Look at the state of it and all of this sort of stuff. And I thought, and I, I went, I remember I went to work and I cried and I didn't, I am, um, I sort of played it down. I just said, oh, my house is a bit of a state and I think I need to do something about it. And in everyone, everyone takes from me saying that everyone takes a different thing. So some people who live in absolute show homes, my house is a bit of a state probably means that there's a couple of days worth of washing up to do, you know, but for me, it was like this, uh, my house is, is full of stuff that, and I don't even know where to begin. So I sent an email to a company actually, um, a cleaning company that dealt with sort of extreme cleans and said, oh, I think I need help here. And I had a really nice, really sympathetic phone call um, with one of the, well, with the owner of the company. And I, and I arranged for some cleaners to come and help me out. And that was, that was the start of it. That was me going, actually, I'm taking the, I'm taking control of this. And it's a bit annoying that it was the landlady that was the catalyst for me to make it real, to make the change. But then once the house was sorted and I wasn't, I was still drinking a lot. And you know what it's like, everyone drinks for their own reasons. And I always think with that gray area drinker, you know, you, there's a sliding scale between, um, being a normal fine drinker and being dependent. And I think my reasons for sliding down that scale were definitely my unhappiness at home and really wanting to numb it out. You know, if I had to be in that house, I may as well be blotto. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I may as well not, not recognize it, but as, as I sort of, I, the house became better and because of that company and I maintained it and, but it was still full of stuff, but it was more organized stuff. And I thought, actually, I need to change this. And the way I was working at the time, I had a couple of zero hour contracts, which um, I do, do, do you get that term in America? Uh -huh. So I, I wasn't employed by, I didn't have a contracted number of hours at any employer. I had a couple of places where I worked on an ad hoc basis. Mm. So if they had the shifts and I wanted to work them, I would work them. If they mm. didn't have the shifts or I didn't want, I, they weren't, they weren't obliged to give me any work and I wasn't obliged to take any work from them. But what that did mean was that financially I wasn't in a particularly strong position. I was earning money, but it was, and I was financially, I wasn't, that was one thing that wasn't, um, that wasn't really an issue other than perhaps my overspending on crap. Um, and I thought that was another thing that I needed to then do. It's like, well, actually, if I'm going to move, 
I need to sort out my finances because even if I take my mortgage with me, it's still another mortgage application. They're still going to look at my finances. They're going to look at my employment. They're going to look at my credit score. And if they're not going to laugh me out of the office, Mm. then I need, you know, I need to do something about it. So that was the the sort of the next step that I took back in um, 22 was to get a contracted job. Thankfully, some, um, some hours came up at the pl- one of the places where I was working, where I really love working. So I sort of applied for it and, and got that job. So that was, it's all of these different things, but in itself, <laughs> sorry, I'm just, but in itself, me getting a job in a, in a department, it triggered quite a lot of the feelings from the one that hadn't gone so well. Mm-hmm. So even that it's, it's, it was emotionally difficult to do it. And they used to lovingly laugh at me because I, when they gave me my locker, cause I never had that when I was on the zero hour contract. And mm-hmm. I used to bring a little, I used to bring a little, um, you know, like just, um, reusable cup and that I and I would carry that around in my handbag and I'd bring my my uniform with me every day and, and trainers and everything with me every day and um and I'd, I'd leave and I, I wasn't I was like the littlest hobo I'd move on to the next place you know there was no I didn't have that commitment so they couldn't they couldn't if if it got difficult I could leave I didn't mm-hmm. have to take any shifts and um and even just getting that contract and then saying, right, there you go. There's your locker. And by the way, this is the cupboard where you can keep your mug. It took me months, absolutely months before I used that locker. And before I, and before I put a mug in that, in that mm. little cup drawer, just because it was like, mm, yeah, I'm not sure I'm ready to commit to a, a place of work. So. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, here in the States, generally, when you talk about independent contractors, that's kind of, it sounds similar to the zero mm-hmm. hour concept, um, perhaps a little different in healthcare, but um, it, it's, it's fascinating to hear that like kind of what's coming up for me is how the experience in the house is kind of coloring or influencing your experience in the workplace and then vice versa, kind of back again, this, this sense of commitment, I guess, and, and your relationship with it. Mm. I'm not really sure where I'm going with that. Yeah. I I think, yeah, I think I know what you mean. It's, it's, it's incredibly intertwined the Mm -hmm. two situations because I suppose to own a home, you need financial stability and for financial stability, you've got to to have a, a good job, you know, mm-hmm. and, and you've mm-hmm. got to tick those boxes. And I think it's that me thinking, right, I need to move made me address some of the other things that perhaps I'd been ostriching away from and I'd not been willing to, to address as well. You know, I think, I think what just came up as you were saying that was um, the thing that sort of, got clearer for me and you tell me it was these commitments. It was something about these commitments, this house, this job Mm. that didn't quite feel right for you. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, well, the, the job that I took definitely, I definitely is right. And I'm still there now a few years on absolutely Mm. happy. And I've, with with the zero hour contract and the fact that I'm still working there, it'll be five years this year that I've worked it there in the same small team. Absolutely love it. Um, but I think, yeah, it's it was definitely my experiences in that house, albeit like when I was on, when I was going through stuff which led to the depression, I was going back and being depressed in that house, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and even, yeah, it, I suppose it had, the house is just, well, it's where I, it's where I survived, I suppose. But mm-hmm. as I said, I think I used the term a little bit earlier. I'm, I just existed for so long in that house, really existed. And, and you were saying earlier, <laughs> I, I kind of interrupted you with a different question, but you were saying earlier, even when you moved, it triggered all these emotions again. What were some of the most significant emotions that Mm -hmm. you were triggered back to and and Mm -hmm. feel like represent that period? Yeah, I felt trapped. 
I felt trapped and um and because I because I quit alcohol at the start of 22 and that was when I just realized it was just doing me no favors Mm -hmm. and I was I was numbing stuff out and it was all you know it was just not it it wasn't it wasn't you know, I did the work. People that don't drink will know what I mean when I say that. You know, I looked at why I was drinking, and it was because I was lonely, and I was, I was lonely, and I drank a lot out of boredom and 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 just habitually. Um, I think making that change to quit and doing that in the house, albeit a nicer version of the house, because by this point, it you know it wasn't as it wasn't as horrific I still hated it I was still Mm -hmm. ashamed of it because also by this point I was very aware that there was stuff that needed doing in the house that I didn't want to do I didn't want to get builders round to quote to do things and so you know it was just it was a house that I didn't particularly like I wasn't proud of and I think but yeah sort of making that when you when you stop drinking you experience all the emotions. You can't numb everything out. So I was doing all of these things for myself and feeling really positive. And it was really sort of amplifying that actually this isn't, you know, this is just wasn't where I needed to be. Mm. Um, And making that choice to move, I really did see it as a clearer start. And It took me ages to get it on the market, actually, to get the house on the market. And that involved skips because I was like, I'm going to declutter. I'm going to drop a I'm going to drop a bedroom. I'm downsizing. So I need Mm. to get rid of some stuff. So there was the physical decluttering that I had to do just but just physically. um, Getting allowing uh, an estate agent to come into this home that I hated to value it was one of the one of the worst, most stressful emotion, well, not stressful, emotionally difficult days that I've had for for a while, apart from like the death of one of my cats. You know, it was, mm-hmm. I remember I didn't sleep the night before. I was absolutely gutted. And I remember when he told me what the house was worth and it was, um, it was probably, I mean, it, it was, it was probably, 25% more than I thought it would be mm. because I hated it so much. I mm. saw no value in it. Mm. I, and I was actually quite shocked what he said I could sell it for. And it was in, in, in hindsight, and obviously it was, it was a good price. It, was, it reflected the work that needed doing and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. But I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it because I just had no value on it. And I suspect you know, people could, you know, if, if it was, if I was sitting in front of a psychiatrist, there's probably some sort of link to but the the worth I put on myself when I was living in that house as well. But yeah, it was, it, I, I did, I felt so trapped in the process because it took so long. And, and so this, this whole kind of journey as it's unfolded, you went from feeling trapped to then realizing you want to change to then starting to make that shift and make those changes. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the third question. What have you learned about yourself as a result of sitting on this comment? (laughs) What haven't I learned about it? (laughs) You know, I, I can do it. I've, I've from a, from an emotional, what I've learned about myself is that I'm stronger than I gave myself credit for. I, um, and that I'm, I, I can make changes and I can do it and I do have the resilience. And I do think a lot of that is the, um, without drinking, you are, you, you know, I am my more authentic self. You know, mm. I, 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 I'm very different as a person to who I was when I started sitting on the comma. Without doubt, I well, touch wood. I will never let myself get into that position mm-hmm. again, even as I'm unpacking. And today um, I've been doing loads of sorting around my new home. And that's because it's like, well, I'm, I've gone into the tip to get rid of the stuff that, you know, like cardboard boxes and things like that. And because it's like, I don't want them just lying around. And, and every, it's all a bit, I've learned that I need to be more honest with myself initially 
and I have been more honest, you know, and if I need help, I will ask for it mm. when I need to, you know, so I've got a friend helping me with some of the DIY because I'm not going to be that stubbornly independent, that person that insists that I can do it myself when actually I can't. So it never gets done. And I think, um, if I can survive that house, even just the way I will deal with neighbours, you know, I, no one knew I was having the problem with with the neighbours when it was happening. Um, well, I wasn't seeing many people because most of it started during the pandemic and mm-hmm. I wasn't talking about it at work because we had our own stuff going on there. But um, I was a bit, he, the um, one of the residents in the house was really quite threatening and intimidating. Mm-hmm. And I didn't I what I should have done was gone to my friends and said oh this has just happened or I'm having experiencing this with this person can I get some advice but I didn't I took it all on board I I, I was so insular at the time and I definitely wouldn't do that again I would mm. definitely be a lot more open and seek help and and seek help it doesn't even just need to be from friends in, in hindsight I probably should have sought um uh, sort of guidance from the authorities on what to do about various situations, but instead I just ostriched, and I will never, I will never just stick my head in the sand again. Mm. Hopefully, mm. I don't think my friends would let me. Actually, yeah. I don't think. <laughs> well, and it sounds like so much has shifted for you. I wonder if you would even be able to let yourself anymore. Because what I'm hearing you describe, like everything that you say you've learned and that you're doing differently now, seems like it's kind of a direct offshoot of all the things that you described while being trapped and and mm. depressed in the in the old place. And so, yeah. like you don't want any of those things, and now you're doing quite the opposite of all of those. Yeah, things. yeah, I think you're right. And and even as I'm planning things around the house, and there's been some setbacks. Builders quotes, sure, <laughs> being one sure. of them, you know, and all of this, like, oh, okay, yeah, that is expensive. So maybe I need to tweak that instead of I'm I've got a book that where I have it's I've 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 called it my facts book, where I've, you know, where it's like when it became apparent that I wouldn't be able to do everything that I wanted to make this house you know, perfect within two weeks, you know, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. I've, I've written down my priorities and stages. And so it's like, well, this is how, this is what I want and this is how I'll do this. And, and I suppose in that respect as well, just making sure I don't have that overwhelm mm-hmm. and I've, I'm talking to people about it and I'm seeking advice and I'm talking to my, to my parents about, um, about the knockbacks and the setbacks. And, but, I'm not panicking. You know, this is this is a long-term home now. Um, and it just, it feels so much different. I am so much calmer. Mm-hmm. And, and things will happen and they will happen when they need to happen. One of my, one of my sober friends has a really good saying, what's meant for you doesn't go past you. Mm-hmm. And I'm a firm believer in that now. And, even if it things don't necessarily look, don't turn out as the plan was, that's fine. That it just turns out that I did the plan wasn't the plan after all. Mm. And as long as I'm holding on to my values and what I I believe, then I'll get through it. And that seems like an important point. Something just came up for me because first of all, I hear you describing yourself now as more optimistic, more hopeful, more trusting, right? Mm. And and yet it's interesting, as you just said what you said, which is, you know, I'm I'm more flexible and plans don't always happen, you know, the way you plan them. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. That's not really different from what it was before. No. But you're different. I'm different. Yeah. Yeah. I'm 100%. I like myself. I'm actually in the middle of writing a blog post, um, half watching Ripley on Netflix. That's going to be an old reference, but that's just, good. Just finished it last night. Oh, <laughs> can't wait. It'll be straight back on after our conversation. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm actually writing a blog post at the minute about how I'm really happy <laughs> and how content I am and how, and, and, and how it's quite, it's, this is something that I am, I'm just not used to. Mm. And and I am. I, you know what? I think I'm actually quite a nice person. 
Do you know what I mean? I'm quite, mm-hmm. I believe I live by my values. I'm really, I'm really happy in my life. <laughs> And it's not necessarily the life that others want. I know it's not a societal norm life. I'm, I'm, you know, 40, 43, no kids, no, no partner. Um, and the people with kids don't necessarily see how I can be fulfilled without them. Mm-hmm. And I can tell, and I speak for, ch- for child free by choice people, hopefully everywhere where actually it can be a fulfilling life. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm fortunate, I suppose, that I'm child free by choice, and um, although I've never tried, I don't know. You know, that's I can understand that if you want children and you're not having them, that can would be absolutely horrific. It would be an incredibly different situation to the one I'm in. But even just being partner free, mm-hmm. the fact that I can make the decisions on the um, on the wallpaper color yeah. you know, i can choose exactly how i want this I, the fact that i live here is entirely my choice you know i didn't have to compromise when it came to finding a house i got the one i wanted because because that's my life mm-hmm. and i'm i'm proud that I made those choices from sitting on my comma. I got the help within the house to sort it out. I cleared it out. I I got the I took the job, which was difficult to, for me to make that step, so that I had the financial security, so that the mortgage company was happy with me. You know, all of those things point to where I am in this home now. Mm-hmm. And, and I will definitely, because I am not numbing anything out anymore. If I felt my mental health do- dropping, I firmly believe that I would be on it a lot sooner than I was. Mm. And and I hear as you describe all of these things, and first of all, just an acknowledgement of just how far you've come and what you created. This didn't just happen to you. You created this. So I want to acknowledge you for that as you've shared with us. And it's just one of the things I'll take is this kind of just fascinating observation of, you know, the place we're in and the person we are and, and we can do the chicken or egg kind of thing, which I'm not going to, I don't think that's really the intent here. It's just this observation of, you know, who you are and where you are and how they can build on each other and feed off of each other, regardless of which one came first. Mm. And that when you change one, it can help change the other. And that can be kind of like a, uh, there's a word I'm looking for, but a um, a cycle that kind of f- feeds and builds itself as well. Mm. So just look at yeah. the shift from, from where you were to where you are now. Mm. Absolutely. The, the next question I want to ask is, uh, and I'm going to change it just a little bit. So what will change for you as a result of sitting on this comma? My openness and my trust in others. Mm. I'm, in, I'm strong and I've got some amazing people, amazing friends, and I will trust them with my truth more often. Mm. I will be honest with them. And I am honest with them now, and I will be honest with myself now. Mm. And um, that is something that I don't think I've ever had the confidence to be before. And I think that is down to going through that comma Mm -hmm. and moving on from that comma. Well, it seems like that's also tied to what you said before about reaching out for help. It's also being able to share and, Mm. and tell your story and talk, talk about what you're going through, mm-hmm. um, with others. And there's no shame in what you're going through. There's mm-hmm. no shame in like, and like with, even just with these builders quotes and stuff, it's, I'm not ashamed to say that I cannot afford, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know what I mean? In certain circles, in certain times, I'd have been like, Oh no, you know, I can't, I can't say that I can't afford it. I'll have to make another excuse. no, that quote is not in my budget. That mm-hmm. is not going to happen. And that means that I'll have to do different things and, you know, it, it take a different lateral thinking approach to how I do things. But there's no shame in not being able to afford stuff. There's no shame in saying, actually, you know what? I'm not having a great week. And 
is it okay if someone comes around just to help me with this one thing that I'm struggling with? Even just my own little mini commas. Mm -hmm. One of them when I was moving was sorting out my clothes. I knew I had to take a load of stuff to the charity shop. And that was one of the last things I got around to doing. And because I just thought this is just so much and it, I did it, but there's just, just identifying these little mini commas that I'm sitting on in the bigger picture. Whereas the one I've sent, the, I've brought quite a large comma to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and that the, the comma that I brought to you is like size 76 font, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas the others are sort of, sort of just in a normal 12. Yeah. And just being aware that these are, these are just slight hiccups. They're just the stopping points and I'll, I'll do them. Mm. And if I can't do them, I'll get someone. To, there's always someone that's going to help you come and sort stuff out in the same way that if a friend said to me, oh, I'm struggling with this one thing, let's go, let's, let's work it out. Let's break it down. Let's do it together. Yeah. And why, if I can do that for the people, then because of the people I've got around me, they can do that for me too. What I think I'm also hearing you say is that now that I've untangled the big knot, I will kind of tickle the threads regularly to prevent knots. And Mm. if knots occur, I now know how to untangle knots. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Christine, last question. What does getting off the comma look like for you? Oh, (laughs) this house, (laughs) you know. um, it, It looks brighter. It looks, it, well, it feels calmer. It's, it's, it's a, it's a relief. It's a, it's an, it's like an aura change. It's an absolute shift. Um, it looks like I'm really pleased to come home. It looks like I'm going to love being here, which is good because I won't be able to afford any holidays from my mm. you know, it's like, <laughs> I'm going to just sit in the kitchen extension. <laughs> Where are you going for your, Chris, for, your, for your holiday this year, Christine? The utility room. <laughs> um, just, it just, it's, it looks brighter. It mm. looks Oh, I can't, it, it just feels so different. And it's funny because even the removal men, when they brought the stuff in, one of them was like, this house feels lovely. And it does, you know, and mm. Aslan's, ha- he's just appeared through the door again. Aslan, my cat is so much happier here. He's calmer. And he, he was outside today, just sort of smell it. He's still a little bit wary because he's not been going out for long. And um, He's just a little bit wary and he's not quite sure. Got a bit scared by a pigeon, bless him, which he probably mm. won't like me saying on a podcast because it doesn't really, <laughs> it's not really great cat behavior being scared by a pigeon. It should have been the other way around, but that was, that was not the dynamic I witnessed. And, you know, everything is just brighter. Mm. The comma from this end looks brighter. Mm-hmm. And and it comes through. It comes through in your voice. It comes through in your smile, which of course our listeners won't be able to see. It, just this whole, as you started your story, you could just kind of feel the weight of it. And now it's just so light and mm. and and just full of possibility. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Wonderful. And I can't wait when you're next in the UK. I can't wait for you to stay in my home Is on the edge of the Peak District. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Open invitation. I, yeah. don't need, I, I don't need excuses to travel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Christine, as you look back on the story, um, and thank you for sharing all of this with us. I can see how how important this is in, in, yeah. your, in your tale and in your story. As you look back over the telling of the story, what would you acknowledge yourself for? Um, doing it, I suppose. And being, I've never really talked about it to anyone else, Mm -hmm. about what that house was like. People know I didn't like it. I think um, being open about that struggle and that struggle that's really only just ended. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah. Yeah, I think just putting myself out there. Yeah. Well, and and I want to acknowledge you as well, because obviously you and I are in some of the same discussion forums and, you know, I've been 
following this just at the end of it, you know, mm-hmm. very remotely and in, in some of the conversation in the in the WhatsApp chat and so forth. Like I now have a different understanding mm-hmm. of what the experience was like and and some of the the reasons behind, you know, some of the comments and the frustrations and the things that you shared. So mm-hmm. I, I greatly appreciate now knowing a little bit more of what that experience was like for you. And yeah. It's, that it has yeah. Been. It's yeah, and I suppose in a way, my it could have been like a sort of it could have seemed like an overreaction with the frustrations of the setbacks at the time, but because it was just, it, it, I just needed that chapter to end. Yeah, it's a testament to your perseverance because as you know, somebody who's half a world away and watching the conversation unfold, you know, often what you would see here in my neighborhood, in my community, in my circles, it's okay. Well, if that's not working out, you know, is that really meant to be, you know, is it time to surrender and let go? And so this is a testament to your perseverance. You were clearly very clear on it has to go. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Even even as you know, to the extent that within a week of me relaxing, because I'd got the keys to my new home, my body was like, right, we need to deal with this gallbladder. (laughs) I had my gallbladder out in emergency (laughs) surgery. (laughs) And it's just since I've not, because that surgery went really well and I've not had any pain since. And it made me realize how much pain I was in my abdomen, that Mm. my body, I was just not acknowledging. It was like, no, we're moving house. So even that, just that chapter of of getting the gallbladder out has just yeah. been very positive since wow. I changed, since wow. I moved. Christine, how can people find you if they wanted to reach out or get in touch with you? Um, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. Where can people yes. connect with you? So uh, my, my, cause this is quite a personal story. My personal Instagram is uh, mistineaf. Um, as I mentioned, and we know each other through coaching. I am a sober coach. And if anyone wants to see what that is, uh, what I do and how I work, um, it's yoursoberpath.co.uk. Um, but yeah, that's it's it, this is a personal story. So if people want to see pictures of my cat and all of that, then, then it's my personal Instagram to go nice. to, really. Awesome. And then also, Christine, one of the things that I like to do in every episode, because this is about you know, it's your platform and it's your story today. Um, We do this thing called acknowledgements and that's where anyone in your circle that you would like to lift up or give a voice to or boost, um, this is the opportunity to acknowledge them. And that can be causes, individuals, creators, or just important people in your life. Who, Who would you like to acknowledge? There is something in my life which is a very, very positive influence. And I now volunteer in the local city one. It's a thing called Sunday Assembly. And it's right, this is going to sound like a cult. It's not a cult. And I know that if it was a cult, that's what I would say. <laughs> but um, it was basically, it's, um, it's all around the world. There are, there's, there's loads of them in the UK, Australia, and America, and beyond. Um, it started up by two comedians who sort of missed church because of the community, but they did not miss the religion. And so it's effectively a faith-free church mm. where you... Instead of singing hymns, we sing along to really cheesy pop songs and well, and other good songs as well. And instead of a sermon, someone comes and does a talk and we hear from all sorts of interesting people. So it sort of follows the structure of what an authentic Christian service would be like. But it's just completely, it's secular. No one, you know, you can come if you've got a faith, but just leave it at the door. And yeah, Sunday assembly, it just... Yesterday, I went to one, I drove for an hour and a half to go to one that's just newly started in the UK. Mm. It's just absolutely brilliant. I, it, it just never, under, never underestimate the joy you can get by belting out Elton John songs at 11 o'clock on a Sunday <laughs> morning. That's what I'd say to that. Well, and it also sounds like it fulfills what you shared with us, right? This sense of connection, the sense mm. of community, this yeah. sense of involvement and contribution. So. Yes. Yeah, very much yes. so. It's it's brilliant. And I, sort of, I recommend everyone check it out in their local area. Wonderful. Well, we'll have the link in the show notes. And as Aslan has showed yes. up to say it's time for this podcast yeah, to be over, absolutely. I will... Thank you for being with us and sharing with us today. You're welcome. Thank you for giving me the space because, yeah, I think I needed that.
Absolutely. Absolutely. And that I hear that so often. And it's one of the things that I love about this podcast is it's not just, you know, what it does for folks who are listening is what it does for us as individuals to be able to share the story and, and it means something different for each person. So I am looking forward to continuing our conversation without the microphone (laughs) and uh, have a wonderful week ahead. And we will be talking to you soon. Thanks, Paul. What an honor and a privilege it is for me to witness these powerful stories. I hope you feel the same way too. I invite you to think about what you learned from this conversation. What stood out for you? What challenged you? What inspired you? And I encourage you to write it down in some form of journaling and reflection. It can be magical to set aside your expectations and just let the thoughts flow out of your head and onto paper and surprises can reveal themselves to you. And if you do discover something you'd like to unpack further, book a call with me and let's talk about it. My links are in the show notes. Meanwhile, be sure to like this episode and follow the podcast here on this platform. Also, follow me on social media at Off The Comma. Interact with the posts, share what you learned from each episode, or just share your thoughts about the topic in general. And check out my website for workshops, events, and updates. If you were moved by today's conversation, pass it along to someone you care about. Thank you for listening to this episode of Off the Comma. As always, keep noticing and keep listening.